Uh, so let's go ahead and start. Um, Chief, what is your name? Uh, what pronouns do you use? Uh, what is your indigenous nation? Okay, well, to start with the last question first, my people are the Avogel tribe of Louisiana. The term Avogel itself means the Flint people uh, because we used to go to Arkansas and get Flint, bring it down here and trade with everybody. Um, since Louisiana has no stone, it was the only way to make arrowheads, lance heads, and knives. Uh, we'd even uh, get the flint for the uh, soldiers because they needed it for their muskets. Uh, I, when you ask for my name, my preferred name uh, with the tribe is Sitting Bear. Uh, however, uh, my legal name, if you will, or American name is Milburn John Mayer. And uh, we, uh, my family has been here for a long time. According to our legends, uh, the tribe has been in Louisiana since the Paleo-Indian period. So we've been here for a while. I th think I answered all of your questions. <laughs> um, Chief, where are you from originally and where do you reside now? Okay, originally uh, I lived in a Boyles Parish uh, in the town of Moralville and then Simsport in Avoyles. Uh, our territory used to include not only Avoyles, but Rapids and Point Coupee. And that was our territory in the old days. Of course, we lost all of that. Right now, I live just south of the town of Doucin in Lafayette Parish. Now, the name Avoyles, for those who might know, that is that derives from your tribal name, correct? Correct. All right. Um, Chief, could you tell us uh, your the general story of your life in a, a few minutes? Uh, people's lives have long stories, but uh, just a short version of your life story. Well, I'll, I'll give it a good try. Uh, I was born in the uh, town of Cottonport in Avalls Parish. Uh, I lived in Mooreville until I started uh, high school. In 10th grade, we moved over to Simsport. My dad worked for the railroad and uh, they closed the depot in Morrowville, so he had to get work uh, over in another area. And uh, I graduated from high school in Simsport, went to USL after that, which today is called UL, as you might know. Um, graduated from there, even though I wasn't technically supposed to be in college there because being uh, part of an indigenous nation, we weren't really allowed to go to schools like that uh, until the mid seventies. And I, I graduated from USL in 1970, mainly because we didn't tell them where we came from. We were able to get by and uh, keep certain things secret. And because of that, we were able to uh, finish uh, education at uh, USL. Then I spent some time in the military, in the Air Force. From the Air Force, came back and uh, did some teaching in Lafayette Parish until I retired as a teacher and then uh, started working at Vermilionville and really enjoying my time at Vermilionville because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the indigenous nations in Louisiana. Uh, there's so little that's known and said and taught that it's really astounding. A few years ago, uh, the state of Louisiana sent me a copy of the book they wanted to use for social studies for eighth grade, and they wanted me to take a look at it and see if I had any suggestions. I noticed that in a book about uh, four inches thick, that there was only one chapter on indigenous people in Louisiana. It was about uh, eight pages long, and half of it was pictures of dancers at powwows. So naturally, the information contained in that one chapter was extremely little. And I felt that by working at Vermilionville, it gave me a chance to at least talk to visitors that come by and let them know about our people and some of the other tribes in Louisiana and the way they were treated and how things uh, happened. Now, for those who don't know, Vermilionville Historic Park is in Lafayette, and it is some people have referred to it as a Cajun colonial Williamsburg. Um, 
<laughs> which I don't think is entirely dissimilar, uh, although there's some vast differences. Um, you, how long have you been working at Vermillionville? I'm beginning my 10th year there. Oh my, so a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of people that we knew when we first started. My wife and I started together. She was the storyteller in the village and she told Indian stories. Uh, and I was a tour guide at the beginning. Then after a while, we did well enough that we were promoted to artisans in the uh, first house, in the Kusa house, which is now the uh, culture's house at Vermilionville. That house has a focus, as I recall, on indigenous people. Am I correct about that? Yes. In fact, Vermilionville is supposed to show the contributions of the indigenous nations, the uh, Europeans who settled here, and the Africans who settled in the area. And that's what we still try to do today in that one house. We bring out all of the contributions that were made by those three groups. In general, like you have spent a good bit of time uh, doing that sort of cultural work, but you, uh, you've you also uh, written a book, correct? About your tribe? That's correct. Uh, the name of the book is The Avogel Tribe of Louisiana. And uh, the author's name, I used the name John because most people knew me by that. And then my Indian name, Sitting Bear, because I wanted indigenous people to take a chance at looking at the book and reading it and seeing what information was there. And I've noticed in the past that uh, if books were written by people with uh, uh, European sounding names, a lot of times they weren't even picked up or, or considered. Do you have plans to write another book? I noticed uh, on the cover of that book, it says it's volume one, and it, I found it a very engaging book. And so I very much would read a volume two if there were one. Uh, do you have plans to write another one? Well, I'm about halfway through with the, you know, with the information for volume two. So the answer definitely is yes, and there will be a volume two in the near future. What is important to you when you are talking about your people or just what is important to you in general? Mainly the, the one thing that I would like for people to know and to recognize is the culture that was here at the time and how things were very different. The, and one of the reasons things turned out the way they did was because of the differences in cultures where people really didn't understand each other when we said one thing and then the Europeans said something totally different, uh, it, it just didn't work out. We went according to what we had always been taught and what we knew. And when they came and, and they used terminology that we expected from them, and then it turned out not to be what they said they were doing. For example, when you went to visit someone else, uh, you would usually declare what your intention was. And if you said we come in peace, you meant that, that you came in a peaceful way without any uh, overt uh, intentions. And you were there to talk and to, to get to know each other, uh, to discuss things that you had in common or the problems you may have to try to take care of those problems. And with the Europeans, it was not that at all. They say they came in peace, but they came there to find information that they could then use to take from you whatever they wanted. What is your own sense of indigenous personal identity? Well, my, my family has been uh, in the area of Falls Parish for, like I said, for a long time, for centuries. And we, uh, we had one, uh, ancestor that came from Picardy in France and married a, a, an Avogel woman and became a member of the tribe. In fact, in the, the very beginning, many of the, the younger French uh, teenagers and the young people, when they were down in that area around Avoyles and Pointe Coupe especially, uh, many of them would leave the towns and come and live with us because they actually were better treated and had more freedom uh, they had true freedom. 
Uh, they could pick and choose to do what they wish to do, and, and nobody would uh, uh, contradict them or, or try to make them feel bad if they made a decision that other people didn't see the same way. They were uh, free to, to state whatever they, they believed, whatever they, they knew or the way they felt, and they were accepted as they were. And we noticed that a lot of elders in the uh, European community uh, started getting very nervous and very upset because they were losing their young people. Did you, speaking of young people, what was your own sense of indigenous identity when you were growing up in Avoyles Parish? Well, uh, most of the people where we lived in Moorville, evidently many of them knew of our background. And I could always had the feeling that I wasn't completely accepted uh, by the other school kids and the other uh, children my own age. And our family was part of the community, but it's like we weren't completely accepted in there that the uh, people were always watching and looking and um, we were treated differently than they would treat each other uh, away from there. So at an early age, I knew there was something different, but I didn't know what it was. And my parents were very careful in telling me not to discuss some of the, some of the, uh, uh, gatherings that we had with family because it was it was dangerous. For one thing, I, I learned at a very young age that my grandfather was an orphan by the age of nine because uh, two white men decided to get drunk one Saturday night and go Indian hunting. And the two, first two Indians they came across were his parents, and they just shot and killed both of them. And uh, nothing was done about it because both men were members of the local vigilante committee and uh, nothing was done. It was just swept under the rug and he just he had to hire out with the neighbors to have enough food to eat, clothes to wear and a place to stay. So he worked his way through. And it was uh, things like that. And we were told not to uh, discuss uh, our background and, and who we were. We were there to hide. Uh, I was also told by my grandmother once that uh, we had a, our tribe had a reputation when confronted by a larger tribe. This was before the Europeans came there, that uh, we always found a way to hide out in the back country in the Voiles until they got tired of looking for us. They'd go away and we'd come back out again. Uh, but evidently we were too good in hiding out because for a long time, any documentation you could find uh, printed, discussed or said that our tribe no longer existed, that in 1900, there were only two old ladies in their 90s left of the tribe and uh, that we no longer existed. Well, other members of the tribe got in touch with me and uh, said they were tired of seeing this and hearing this. And that's why they convinced me to write the book I did to let them know that we were still around. Um, and I've been trying to, to get that message across. It's, it's very difficult. Um, it, it's, it's been a battle. It took me 10 years really to get the information I did for the book because I, I found data in sources that you would have never thought would have held information, uh, on the subject. And, uh, it, it was, it's as though somebody was guiding me when I was doing it. I felt very good about it. Um, I think I could have done better, but uh, the book kind of speaks for itself. Like you said, you read it, and I think you may have gotten some insights in, into our people from what you read. You mentioned uh, that when you were growing up, you didn't really, you were told not to talk too much about the sort of family gatherings what sort of gatherings were these? Were these sort of like uh, ceremonial gatherings, dance, dances? or Yes, they were. Actually, they were. We called them uh, family reunions uh, because that's the terminology you had to use to make sure that uh, no one would uh, 
try to give us a problem because of that. But yes, the thing is, you had language that was used that was not uh, not French at the time. Uh, later on, I learned that it was actually the Avogel language and also the trade language that had been developed uh, centuries ago. And uh, they did the dances and some of the, the ceremonies that we did. Uh, I learned how to uh, conduct a pipe ceremony as a young man, and uh, but was told to be very careful not to let others outside of the family know what was going on. Um, we, we tried to do as much as we could uh, in, in places where we were not observed by others. And uh, again, we had to hide out. We had to be very, very careful of how we did things and, and what we said and what we did. We had to be very guarded because, uh, well, for one thing, uh, we had another uh, tribe that was not very happy and they tried to take our land from us. They tried to help the, the, the whites take the land from us. And so we had to be careful not to become too obvious or too well known because it was going to invite a bullet in the back. Do you think that, I guess uh, now you spend time telling people about indigenous identity and in earlier times, it was very advantageous to hide that same identity. I'm sort of wondering when did the transition occur? When did you feel that you were able to sort of live out loud and say things out loud and sort of um, be sort of outwardly expressive of your Avogel identity? It came about in, for me, it came about in uh, the 1980s. Um, we were beginning, my wife, whose background is Choctaw, uh, we decided to start attending some of the powwows in the local area. And uh, we felt a lot more comfortable there at the powwows because we were among our own people, really. And uh, my father uh, had always been reluctant to, to talk about family and history. And uh, we finally convinced him to join us at one of the powwows in Marksville and in Evolves Parish. And uh, when he came, it just sort of change things for me and gave me the courage that I was looking for to not to be afraid so much and to uh, get out a little bit more. The conditions or the news reports too that I saw with the BI, with the uh, AIM movement and some of the other people from the uh, Lakota uh, nation sort of encouraged me too that we needed to do something like that in a Voss parish and, and bring the tribe back to meeting. And we started meeting again at the, uh, the, the center in uh, Marksville where the mounds are that we built centuries ago. And uh, we were able to get the people to start coming back there and, and, and meeting together, uh, not just uh, one or two families, but several families and starting to get them to be willing to, to bring out the, the fact that they were Avogel and they were proud of their history and what has happened in the past. Uh, but I would say to answer your question, the 1980s were probably when it turned around for me and uh, even before I went into the military. Uh, and at that time, uh, my mother was the, was the leader of the, the, the tribe. Um, people always looked up to her because whenever somebody needed anything, she was the one that they would go to and she would always uh, help with the healing and with uh, different things. I noticed that my grandmother and uh, one great aunt that I had also started teaching me some of the, the healing things that they knew from uh, past experience and uh, which I've tried to teach my grandkids now uh, when they're willing to sit and listen. That's a, it's another difficult thing. But uh, passing things along or can sometimes be difficult. By healing, did they, did they teach you about different plants and, and the like? Right. Plants, animals, uh, 
parts of animals. It could be used uh, different plants. Um, things like uh, the spider web was very useful for stopping bleeding and, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I had a, uh, a, a great aunt uh, that the family was really very proud of because she had she could read and write in French. And she was the first person in the family that was actually educated. And the fact that she could read French and understand it and write it, um, everybody in the, in the family was very proud of her. Then of course, when my brothers and uh, my brother and sister graduated from high school, they were the first ones that had ever gotten an education uh, at that point. So it was even more important when I went to college, they were all looking to see if I could complete the time. And when I finished, there was a great deal of pride among all of the people that someone had finally made it that far. I'd like to circle back to something you mentioned about the gatherings you would have in a Boyle's parish. And that has to do with language, uh, the language they were speaking or that you speak, is that Mobilian or is it, I guess what people would call Mobilian? Yes, it was because uh, if, as you might be aware of the, and I hate the term Mobilian jargon because that's what they call it, but uh, because we called it the trade language uh, that was started about I'd say roughly about 6,000 years ago, the tribes in the Southeastern US got together and put this language together. And with my people, it was especially useful before the Europeans came because we made our living through trade. We not only got the Flint from Arkansas and brought it down here, but we also got, uh, when the Europeans finally brought uh, horses to, uh, to Texas, the Spanish brought it, We'd go to Texas and get horses and cattle, and we'd bring that back and trade with everyone as well. And uh, the, uh, the, the trade language made it easier for us to trade with the other tribes because not all the tribes, we didn't have families of languages here in Louisiana, as I'm sure you're aware of. Each tribe had its own distinct language. And by having the trade language, we were able to go around and communicate with the others and uh, and do the, the trading that we wanted to do. Uh, our tribe was always kind of small because we always encouraged people to marry outside of the tribe for two reasons. One was healthy children. Another was that by marrying outside of the tribe, we had relatives in all the other tribes. So we we're always welcome when we came to visit. And uh, I found out through visiting some of the tribes uh, that that still was uh, a deal with them when they when they knew who I was and 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 they would see us coming and we'd sit down and talk to them. Uh, we found a very warm welcome from these people, even though they were they were different. They were from a different tribe, but they accepted us rather quickly. And I, I was it made me feel really good. Does that sense of diplomacy, the ability to make alliances, is that something that has, was transmitted to you or something that you've been able to use in your life uh, as you've left at Royals Parish? Or? Yeah, it did. One of the things that, that I was uh, really glad to find out was that uh, in the old days, uh, the, the Avogel on the west side of the river, the Nachi on the east side of the river, and the Homa when they lived uh, at Angola. Uh, the three tribes uh, worked together. Uh, we cooperated, we were allies. And we did a lot of things. Uh, we were distinct tribes, different languages, different customs, but we worked together. And it was, uh, the, the, the history is really interesting. Uh, the way things happened, um, we, um, in fact, we, we've tried, I tried uh, to reestablish the links we had between the Nachi and also the Homa. Um, it's, it's gotten some success, but it's, the success was limited. Basically, because the Nachi, there are not very many that are, uh, that are left uh, after the, the French uh, did away with them. Most of them were sold as slaves in the Caribbean. 
Uh, a few were able to uh, start living with some of the tribes later on in Oklahoma. And there are very few today that know that they have uh, Nachi blood. Uh, with the Homa, uh, I've been speaking with, uh, with Mr. Dordor when he was uh, the principal chief there for a while. Uh, he's, not, he's not the chief anymore. Uh, and we've had several conversations and I've, I've tried to reestablish that link. And the best I could do is just to get to be on a friendly basis with him and, and where we can talk and we can sit down and visit. Um, so I guess it was a limited success. Um, over in, we went, uh, my wife and I and my family went over to a, a powwow in Natchez uh, a few years back. And while we were there, we met an old Nachi holy man who was there at the museum uh, where the, the main, the Great Sons Village was. And I started to introduce my, my family to him when we met him in, in the museum. And he stopped me and he said, you don't have to tell me who you are. He says, I know who you are. And this rather perplexed me and my family because we had never met this man before. This was the first time we had ever been with him. And he proceeded to tell my wife who her relatives were by name. And my wife was just astounded. She couldn't believe that this man knew that much information about her and because we had never seen him before. And it was really an eye opener and kind of scary in a way uh, when it <laughs> first happened. This man knew us, I mean, really knew our, our families. And uh, again, it was the first time we had ever laid eyes on this person. That must have been a little unnerving. Yes, it was. But you know what? We got to be very good friends. I, I just, I don't know what happened to him after that powwow, but he... I enjoyed talking to him so much. It, it really uh, uplifted my heart a whole lot uh, in being able to talk to this man because uh, he was able to put things at, at peace uh, that, that troubled me for many years. And he was able to sort of calm the spirit. And I found that was a very interesting thing to do for him to be able to do. I happen to know that the, the park that's up there where the Nachi village was, that the park rangers there actively try to communicate with the Nachi as they're currently constituted in order to maintain good relations in this historic site. Um, you, your tribe, you mentioned a meeting there uh, where the mounds are in Marksville, do you find that you, do they reach out to you or do you, what's your relationship with the community in, in Marksville? Well, the, with the people in Marksville, uh, the ones of European descent, the, I find them to be rather standoffish. They're not very warm or uh, encouraging uh, with the, uh, with the other nations, uh, and, I, and I hate to say this, uh, besides the Tunica, uh, the other nations, the uh, Biloxi, the Ofo, the Choctaw, uh, we get along very well, very easy with them. And uh, we haven't had any problems uh, in talking to some of the elders in the tribe. When I was getting the information together for the book, I found out that our people were actually part of the mound builders uh, along the Mississippi. Uh, Poverty Point, we helped to build Poverty Point. And when that was completed, we came down the river and then built the mounds at Marksville and then made that our main village there. The back door, the second village was over at Le Rapid, the rapids between uh, Alexandria and Pineville. And uh, the, the, the history of the tribe is really amazing as, as far as I was concerned. I was flabbergasted in, in seeing some of the information that the elders in the, in the tribe that I got to talk to uh, before they passed away, that the information that had been passed down in secret uh, for many years. And uh, it, it, it was really astounding. Uh, you mentioned uh, the other nations of 
of Loyal's Parish. Of course, the Tunicabaluxi tribe of Louisiana has their reservation there. And as I re could you tell us about uh, the relationship between the Avigal as a separate entity with that tribe, which is in amalgamation of multiple groups. I believe you told, you wrote about your relationship with the federal government and relationship with that tribe in your book, as I recall. And that's a tribe that got recognition during our lifetimes. Could you speak to that? Yeah, uh, I can. Um, having done some of the research, the first time that the Tunica applied for federal recognition, uh, they were told by the BIA that uh, they were being turned away because there were only about 10 or 12 families and they were just not large enough for the BIA to take care of. And uh, they're they were satisfied with the documentation that had been sent in at the time, uh, but that there just weren't enough people. So about 10 years later, they reapplied as a confederation of tribes. Uh, they decided that they needed more people. They needed at least 200 people to, for the BIA to accept them. And so they took in some of the other tribes that had uh, started to live in a Vols parish uh, the Choctaws from around Choctaw Bayou, um, the Ofo, the Biloxi that had come in, that were, uh, had come in some years uh, before. Um, and then, of course, they had uh, two Avogel families that were still living in that same area that, that became the, the reservation for the Tunica. Um, and they took them in and found out the main reason that they were able, that they were willing to accept those two families, and it was just two families, was that they made the claim that that were the only ones left of the tribe, and since they were being accepted in with the other with the rest of the group, they could claim Avogel lands that were there, and that was the purpose of allowing those two families to to be with them. Um, it, it later on in, in in looking around and talking to more people and. When the word got out that we were trying to get the, the tribe back together, more families came forward and uh, came together with us uh, because they they were feeling the same things we felt, that it was time to come out of hiding and it was time to be known again. What? Um... If I may say one thing. Yeah, please I, continue, yeah. I, I happened to, when I was very young, I happened to uh, speak to the uh, to the leader at the time um, who uh, and, and I had asked him about uh, how it felt to be the leader of the tunica. And uh, he looked me in the eye and he was very unhappy. I could tell by the expression on his face. And he politely informed me that he was Biloxi and not tunica. This was old Chief Perit, and old Chief Perit was a wonderful man to know. He was very gentle, very friendly, uh, an outward going person, and he took his position as chief of, of the people there very serious, and he tried to do the best that he could. Uh, it was really a tragedy when uh, his time was at an end, and we no longer had him around to, to help the, the people there. Uh, he tried to do a lot of things, and, and he was a good leader. Do your people have a relationship with the Tunica Biloxi now? Do you go to their powwow? Do you have meetings with them? Uh, as far as meetings, we tried. I tried at, uh, some years ago. I think it was in the, yeah, the mid-'80s, 1980s. I sent them a letter telling them, uh, letting them know that we were bringing the tribe back together, that we were not going to try to take anything away from them or create any problems of any kind. We just, I just wanted to, to know that we were just getting our people back together. And they would not answer. Um, through the years, uh, going to the powwows in Marksville, because we went to the powwows in, in all of the powwows in the state, uh, I got to know uh, John... Uh, 
uh, who's one of the gourd dancers, and my son and I are gourd dancers at the powwows. Um, uh, John Barbary was there, and we've gotten to be acquaintances, and uh, I, I'd say probably friends as well. But um, we we never got to be close because he was always more interested in the the tunica. And one thing I found out uh, recently is that they have a grant to preserve the tunica language, which is a good thing. But since they're a confederation of tribes, and they're usually referred to as the Tunica Biloxi, and nobody mentions the other three of the confederation, uh, I sometimes wonder if it's appropriate that the only language being preserved is the Tunica and not the others. Um, that's, that's something that I have a concern about. Are you interested in, are, do you have a concern that about preserving, say, the version of the trade language that you grew up speaking? Uh, yes. The people in the tribe, we, in some of our meetings, our gatherings we've had uh, since the, the 1980s, uh, they've said that they don't want to share it with outsiders of the tribe because it's the only thing we have left that we feel still belongs to the Avogel tribe. And we're afraid that if we share it with others, it'll be taken away from us like everything else was. Um, we, we've, we've had to, to fight so hard and so long to, to keep the little bit that we do have uh, that we don't really uh, want to share it. When I wrote the book, I gave a copy of it to um, an anthropologist at LSU to look over it and to make any comments. In fact, she wrote the, the foreword in the book. And uh, she had asked me the same thing about preserving the language. And would I work with some of the uh, linguists at LSU to try to make recordings and, and write down because the language had never been written. And uh, I told her what the tribe had decided, how they had voted. And she said, well, she was not happy that that was their decision, but she could understand why they felt the way they did. And Jen, do you, is that something that, um, I'm trying to see how I can say this. Are you still actively teaching the language within the tribe? We're trying to, to preserve it as much as we could. We've had to pass a rule in the tribe itself that parents are required to speak to the children in the language at home. And they, again, the parents usually tell them, you know, don't use it outside of the tribe. It's to be used only among tribal members so that we can keep it there. But it's extremely difficult because of television and radio and everything else. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that too, because of the English language uh, or the American language. It's, it's, uh, it's a real battle to try to get the kids to, to use it. Many times they'll, they understand the language, but because of the parents using it with them, but then they usually answer the parents in English. It, it's hard, but we're, we're making the attempt. We're trying to preserve it as much as we can. Other than language, what would you say are the principal elements of Abigail culture? Uh, I would say the, from the culture point of it, it, it's just the way that we always took care of our own people. Um, technically, since the uh, Avogel were included in the Confederation of Tribes when the Tunica uh, applied for federal recognition, technically we're a federally recognized tribe. Uh, the group that, uh, my group uh, that I have, uh, I guess we, we just never proven to the BIA that we were part of that tribe. And that's that's what we have to do, but what, what I'm getting back at is the cultural part is uh, the way we lived, uh, the hunting, the fishing, uh, the trading that we did with other groups, um, getting people to know what what we had done in the past uh, was very important. Uh, we traveled because we made our living through trade. 
We went, like I said, as far as north as Cahokia in the Illini country. We went as far east as the, the Seminoles down in Florida. Uh, we went as far west as the uh, Navajo. We knew some of them. We even had contacts with the Aztec before the Spanish came. We traveled quite a bit and we had news from all of those areas. We were well known uh, by the tribes in those days uh, and always welcome. We, we never had any problems with any of them, uh, mainly because we knew as the old saying went, uh, translated saying, we knew how to behave as human beings. So you knew how to relate to other people in their culture. Exactly. <laughs> and that trade language certainly helped a lot. If it wasn't for that, I don't know how we could have done what we succeeded in doing uh, because of the fact that we could go in, you know, and talk to people. Uh, sign language was important as well, but uh, it wasn't used as much as the trade language was. And that trade language was very important. Well, I, I certainly thought of you a few years ago. I was doing some field work and I was standing on an Atacapa Ishak shell midden on the Gulf of Mexico. And this midden was covered with quite a bit of pottery. And I looked down and there was a small piece of flint that had been struck on one side and ground on the other. I still have it at my house. And I just thought the Abigail must have been here or handed this to someone. <laughs> and I was like, there you are. I know you were the, I thought of you immediately <laughs> because I just think of you and I think of Flint like that. And um, I can definitely say you probably had some relationship with my own people. <laughs> well, um, you know, that's one uh, thing with the, with the Hatakapa. Uh, as, as you're well aware of, the word hatakapa means man-eater. And they were accused of being cannibals. And we never had any problem. We go through their land all the time to go to Texas and, and the West. And they never gave us any trouble. We never had a problem with the hatakapa, with the ishak. And we, we got along very well with them. Uh, I, that's one thing I was uh, always astounded me. And then when I found out how the, the tribe had been killed and destroyed by the, by the French, it, it, was, it, it hurt quite a bit uh, because they were good people. They were nice people. They were friendly. They didn't give us any trouble. They helped out sometimes, many cases. Um, it's, it's, it's something that uh, I found very, very tragic uh, to see how today there's only three small bands left, uh, clans really, of the tribe today. Uh, and when you get to meet them and you go over there to their uh, gatherings, uh, they're, very, they're still friendly. They still remember us. They still talk about the past and how we got along together. And especially the ones in, in uh, Apelousas. Um, we've, we've gone over there and helped out many times when they've had gatherings there. And uh, they've always given us the warmest of welcomes. You'd swear we were family, that you know we were even part of the tribe as far as they were concerned. They, they treated us as tribal members uh, many times. Uh, I, I just couldn't get over how warm they were to us and how they, they accepted us. Um, it, it, was, it was really interesting. And I have to apologize. Sometimes I ramble on. You might need to rein me in once in a while and get me back on subject. <laughs> Chief, you are a tribal elder. Uh, I would expect no less. I would be disappointed if you did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am wondering, uh, you have a good bit of experience interacting with members of other indigenous nations. Mm -hmm. Uh, what sort of, what cultural practices have you adopted from other nations that maybe are things you didn't grow up with or things not traditionally associated with the Abigail? Uh, mainly uh, uh, ceremonial dress, I would say, uh, uh, sometimes called costumes, sometimes called mm -hmm. outfits, whatever, uh, like the, the outfits that are, are worn at powwows. As you know, most of them uh, really refer or go back to the Plains uh, tribes. They were not, uh, the, the tribes here in Louisiana didn't dress the same way that the Plains Indians did. And uh, we had our own way. Um, 
that was something that I had to, to kind of change over. And I've tried working with the Boy Scouts quite a bit, uh, trying to get them in their, uh, their ceremonial, their uh, Art of the Arrow uh, ceremonies that they do to uh, be more like the tribes that were here in Louisiana and to make their, their uh, outfits more like the outfits that were worn here, the ceremonial outfits that were worn by the, by the different tribes in the local area. And it, uh, it took a lot of work to find out how these people dressed. And I've had one visitor that came into Vermilionville one day and wanted to know if the way I was dressed, that's the way we dressed all the time. And I had to tell them, no, I'm sorry, it's not. This is the way we would have dressed in winter uh with the clothing that i was wearing um because if i dressed like we did in summer they would be insulted and they would find it objectionable <laughs> what do you generally wear at vermilionville do you mean like they would object because they you'd be wearing a loincloth or probably because yeah. in in the summer as you know in louisiana it's so hot and humid yeah that really the, the men more than a loincloth you didn't need more than that uh women's dress in the old days uh, all the women wore was a skirt. They, you know, and, and that was it in the summertime. And of course, when you grow up in a culture like that, you don't think anything about it. If they tried to do that today, they'd get arrested and thrown in jail. Okay. So how do you dress when you are at Vermilionville? What do you generally wear uh, as a historical interpreter there? Well, um, uh, most of the time I'll be, I'll wear the, leather leggings with the, the fringe on it uh, and painted in a style that would have been worn by somebody in the tribe. Uh, as you know, the leggings were used only when you were uh, on, a, on a trip, when you were traveling to protect the legs. It was not worn in the village itself, uh, but I wear that because it gives me a chance of uh, telling people or uh, informing people why they had fringe on leggings. It wasn't just to look good, which it does, but there were different uses for it and there were different purposes for the fringe. Um, also, I would, uh, the shirt that I wear is uh, usually the, the type of shirt that was worn by the Coureur de Bois uh, in the 1700s. And because uh, it gives me a chance to let people know that we didn't wear skins all the time, contrary to what Hollywood would have you believe. Uh, we knew how to make cloth. We did make cloth. Uh, from different plants that grew. We even had wild cotton that grew in this area uh, that we could use and we did use. We had the, the, the bark of certain plants that were used to make cloth or paper uh, later on. Um, I usually wear an otter skin uh, hat because the otter skin was very uh, popular among the, the male members of the tribe, of my tribe. Uh, we believe that the otter chased away evil so if you wore the otter skin hat and people, strangers came up to you, if they didn't start running away, screaming and hollering for help, then you knew they were good people and you had nothing to worry about. Uh, so I get to tell people about that. Um, when Iberville and Bienville uh, signed the treaties with the tribes along the Mississippi when they first came up, they uh, handed out uh, gorgettes to the leaders in the tribe to remind them of what the treaties bound them to, uh, the understanding. Uh, we couldn't read them, but they told us what was in there and they gave it to the leaders. And so uh, being one of the leaders in the tribe, I still wear one of the gorgettes today when I, as part of my outfit. Um, I'm also the leader of the bear clan in my tribe. So I do wear the bear claws around my neck. Um, Lately, unfortunately, I've had to also start carrying a, a knife with me for possible protection because I got an email one day that told me if I didn't stop telling the stories about the different tribes in Louisiana and what happened to some of them, that I could be met with bodily harm. So unfortunately, I've felt a need recently of protecting myself if necessary. Um, the moccasins that I wear or I make myself they are the Eastern Woodland moccasins. They're sewn on the top of the foot instead of on the outside edge like they do in the Great Plains. Um, I do wear a breech cloth because that was something that was common. But before the breech cloth was worn by the members of the tribe, we actually had something that was very similar to a kilt. 
that was worn uh, prior to the breech cloth. The breech cloth was more an influence from the, the Plains tribes that we came in contact with. What was the kilt made out of? Uh, well, it was made out of cloth primarily. Uh, again, they had different plants that they could use to make the cloth and, and cloth was a lot easier. Uh, it was not made of leather. Um, I don't know where this idea that every time that, that whenever we did dress, we always dressed in leather. That's, that's not, it's not appropriate. You, you would, you would, uh, you wouldn't live, you wouldn't survive in Louisiana in the summertime if you dressed in leather. You mentioned, uh, that the fringe, the uses of the fringes on leggings. Could you speak to that? That seemed particularly interesting to me. <laughs> yes, a lot of people don't realize that when leather gets wet, it gets very heavy and it takes a while for it to dry. But if you have fringe, the water drips off the fringe faster and it dries faster. Oh. So that's one of the purposes of the fringe. Also, if you're on a journey and you forgot to bring some string or twine or whatever, and you didn't have something to, let's say, make a rabbit snare, you could always cut off a few pieces of fringe. You could tie them together and you had what you needed to make your rabbit snare to catch your supper. So uh, you had a lot of different uses for that fringe besides just being decorative and looking good. It, had, it was a very useful item. And with us, you know, we were always trying to find things that were of use. One thing about our outfits that I'd like to mention is we never color coordinated anything. We believe that the more color you had that you wore, the better you looked. <laughs> so <laughs> the more colors you had, the better it was for you. Did, I like the, you know, you're speaking of something I hear so often within indigenous cultural is that there is something that is aesthetically pleasing that also has very practical use and that seems to be a real theme um, and uh, when you were speaking about the fringes I had heard that before but I'd forgotten it so that's, <laughs> I'm glad that you I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think my dad had told me that at some point um, I am wondering uh, you you have a good bit of uh, lore and stories and et cetera that you tell when you are uh, at Vermilion Will and outside. Are there any stories that you recall being told about the mounds near where you grew up? Well, there was one story in particular, the one that was located directly behind the museum that was there in Morksville. That Sorry about the lightning in the background there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, and they eventually put a fence around it to keep people from going up and down and also the local kids from riding their bicycles up and down the mound. Originally, that thing was uh, a trash pile. And I tried telling that to the people at the museum and, and others. And they said, well, somebody had gone and dug into that mound and they found they actually found a burial there the tunica claimed to have put there. And I found that rather interesting because the elders in the tribe were saying, no, that that was originally a trash mound. Hmm. Uh, and then some of the other mounds, uh, the, the big mound, uh, there was only one uh, dwelling that was placed on that. And it was the, the principal chief of the tribe's dwelling there. And uh, it was also um, like the... Um, a ceremonial uh, place for some of the dead chiefs were, were, were buried there. Um, it's uh, the place also where the sacred fire was kept by uh, members of the tribe, uh, which the, the Nachi had given to us and asked us to hold on to them in case theirs went out so they could relight it from ours or from the one that they gave to the Homa. Uh, so there would always be a continuation of the fire, of the original fire. And um, uh, we've kept the fire going uh, through the time. Uh, the the home tell me they no longer uh, have the fire there, unfortunately, because of the the quick withdrawal they had to do from Angola to where they are today. So as far as I know, we're the only ones who still have it, um, and have keepers in the in the tribe that that keep the fire going. Um, 
and that's in Marksville or near there? No, well, it's it's one of the families in Marksville that takes care of the fire. They keep it at home uh, very discreetly. Yeah. Thinking just about, like, yeah, go, oh, I'm sorry. Please go just on. like one of the, we have another member of the family, uh, his first name is Joseph. I'm not going to say the last name who also keeps the, the tribal bundle and uh, keeps it in a safe place so that it's not lost. Because uh, over the years, there's been many times where we were afraid it was going to be stolen or, or desecrated or uh, just destroyed. And we feel that as long as that bundle exists, the tribe will continue to exist because it is the soul of the tribe. And this is a bundle of sacred items or right like yes this? yes sacred items that are in the bundle thinking chief about who the audience is for this uh what what are, can you think of something maybe that we haven't talked about that that we our larger audience might want to know well, one thing I try to tell the, the visitors we have that come to Vermilionville is that in Louisiana, things were very peaceful down here. There was practically no warfare between the tribes that existed in Louisiana. And if you see some of the old maps of the tribes that existed prior to the Europeans coming here, you would see that Louisiana was very densely populated. Uh, and the reason for this peacefulness, uh, I believe, is because of the fact that uh, there was an old saying among the tribes that if you lived here and you were hungry, it's because you were too lazy to get up and go get your food. Because here it grows year round. If you didn't like meat, there were certain plants you could use year round for food. If you didn't like the plants, there was seafood. There was always something. And when people have a full stomach, they don't think very often about you know, bothering their neighbors or, or fighting their neighbors. That plus the, the trade language, if you had a problem with another tribe, there was no reason why you couldn't go with, to that tribe and discuss the problem with them and talk it over. And if you can talk, there's again, less of a chance of any physical action being necessary, you know, of fighting happening. So with those two things, I think that was what was very important about this area because we've seen in other areas where tribes did fight each other and did have wars. Uh, I had a friend who was Comanche and as far as he was concerned, the lowest human form of life on the planet were the Ute. He could not stand being close to a Ute. <laughs> <laughs> Even now. Even now. And I asked him one day, I said, what about the Paiute? He says, they're the same people. <laughs> <laughs> um, who would you like to be the audience for this uh, conversation? Uh, I would like especially the, the, the kids in school to get to hear this. Because like I said, what, what they have in social studies, uh, like in fourth grade, they talk about the Plains tribes. And that's good. I mean, it, it, there's nothing wrong in learning about the culture over there. But why not learn more about the culture of the tribes that were in Louisiana? Uh, we need to, to concentrate more on our own people. And I think if the kids would see and understand how our people lived and how we, we, we got along, that it would be something a positive learning experience for them in the schools. And I think it's especially important for the kids in school to know this. Why that's, one of the that's one of the reasons why now, when, now that my wife passed away two years ago in April, uh, I still tell a lot of her stories uh, for like summer camp at Vermilionville. And when we have young people come in to visit, uh, uh, I tell the stories that she would have told. Why do you think there has been that focus on tribes outside of Louisiana rather than the ones that we have here? I think primarily because of Hollywood 
And like Hollywood would have you believe, a man could buy a wife, which wasn't true. Because if a woman, if you wanted to marry a woman and you asked her to marry you and she said no, it was no. And there was no requirement. Uh, even her parents did not force her to marry somebody she didn't want to marry. Uh, you know, things like that, that, that came up. Uh, I think they need to get a realistic view of what life was like prior to the Europeans coming and, and being here. Uh, I don't say that we should uh, knock the European culture or anything like that at all, but just be positive about the way the people lived, you know, at that time. And that you didn't have the cannibalism that some of the tribes were accused of being. They were not cannibals. Um, they may have had some ceremonies that were not understood by the Europeans, and they would call them cannibals because of that. But as you may know, even among the, the Plains tribes, if a warrior was an extremely good warrior, and if he was killed in battle, it was not uncommon to have the heart of the liver of the, the individual eaten by some of the other warriors from the other tribe to gain his courage, his, his, uh, uh, his strength. Um, and that could be considered cannibalism, if you will. Right. Um, I'm sure that Haley, my colleague, has some questions. Haley, do you have any questions you are? Absolutely. Mulling over. I'm going to hand it off to Haley Chief, and I will okay. still be here. Right. Um, I think one question that I that I had just standing out um, was, you know, you've spoken a lot about um, your leadership role within the tribe, um, and I imagine there's a point, you know, where there's things that you feel that are different than like what's um, then maybe, you know, maybe your opinion is a little bit divergent than that of the people that you represent. Could you talk a little bit if that happens often and how you negotiate that? And Well, um, sometimes I don't always agree with what the, the, the rank and file members of the tribe, uh, you know, vote for. Uh, but I've always always come to the conclusion that whatever they decide to do is we do it together and even if I don't agree with it uh, I try to convince people uh, by uh, explaining to them why I, I believe the way I do and, and the reasons for it and if I can't uh, convince them and they have uh, and, and they go against it then that's fine I, I go along with them and go along with the majority of the of the people because I think uh, it, it's all, we, we have to work together as a people, as one. And uh, we're all entitled to our own opinions. I uh, uh, always did the best job I could. And, and it is, until I retired as the principal chief of the tribe, um, the people never uh, had anyone else that, was, uh, uh, that came forward to, to take my place. In fact, I had to work at it for some years to finally find someone who was willing to do the, the work that I was feeling tired of. Uh, I'd gotten to the point where I just needed a rest. Uh, I'm getting too old. I'm an old man. You know, so speaking, I guess uh, there's like two points from that. I want to know a little bit more about personally, and then I also want to know about like what it is, um, you know, the representation and leadership that that you no longer want to do but you have a lot of experience with um i guess one thing that i heard a lot within what you were saying is that one of the roles that um that you found most beneficial for you to take for your people was that of like a, an ambassador or a diplomat um you mentioned that the abigail were very uh were um mostly survived through trade um and I'm wondering if you can give us a kind of further go into the description of what do you think diplomacy is and what do you think diplomacy is, particularly in the indigenous context? Well, the, the way I look at it, and the way I've always tried to, to work with it was um, I would present to someone my idea and why I felt the way that I did 
And then I would leave it up to them to decide whether they agreed with me or not. And if they disagreed with me, then I just considered that to be their point of view. And I respected them for their for what they believed in. Um, and then when it came to the tribe itself, uh, I always felt that the majority should be uh, controlling what's going on, uh, even though it was something I may not agree with. One example that I can give you is uh, for a few years, uh, the tribe uh, sponsored one of the uh, Boy Scout uh, OA uh, groups here in Lafayette. And we acted as their advisors to, to help them with their ceremonies and, and different things that they were doing. And it got to a point when the Boy Scouts decided that uh, they were going to allow uh, transgender people uh, to be part of scouting the members of the tribe then decided that it was time to terminate our uh, uh, connection with the office, uh, the Order of the Arrow, with the Boy Scouts. And personally, I didn't see anything wrong with what the Boy Scouts were doing. But since the tribe voted that way, I had to notify the, the Scout Council that we could no longer help to support them like we had done in the past. And uh, it was a difficult thing for me. Because I remember that in the old days, we had people like that in the different in the tribes, and these people were never ostracized. And I tried to remind the, the members of the tribe today about that. But again, I was outvoted. So I went along with what they did. And I informed the tribe, the Boy Scout Council of their decision. Mm -hmm. When we were thinking about um... You know, also like so. Part of part of your role as leadership was to to communicate with people, or you know, without with these organizations, and and kind of you know be the messenger of the people's will in these cases. Um, when we're thinking about intertribal, so you know, tribe versus tribe to tribe. Oh, you know, when you're going into these conversations, or you know, when you're when you're approaching another tribe, what is your your what is the outcome you're looking for? What is the best possible thing that you would want um, from that kind of interaction? The main thing that I've always worked for and would try to establish was just a working relationship with those people, uh, with that tribe. Uh, have a working relationship between my tribe and that and the other tribe. Uh, a matter of being friends. Uh, that that's the idea behind it and uh not not to convince them of anything or to change their ways of doing things or to make them see our way of doing things but just to understand that we can we can help each other out we can work together and we need to because we're right now we're such a small minority we have got to help each other out if we don't we won't survive the, our numbers are dwindling every day. And it's, it, I find it very, very scary when I see the number of people that are, that, that, that are going, uh, going away that we don't have anymore. Um, this pandemic that came up was one thing that really caused a lot of reflection. For, for my people, it was like the second coming of the same old Calvary uh, because of what had been done in the past. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's things like that. It's just, like I say, a working relationship, just, just to be able to, to cooperate and help each other out. Yeah. By the way, I love hearing the thunder in the background. It sounds like <laughs> quite a storm's going on. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I can't control that. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't be sorry for it. I, I appreciate hearing it. it. Hearing it just makes me think of cool and calming rain. So I'm glad it's there. Could you so one of the things that you just said was that you know you know dwindling numbers and working relationship could you give me an example of of what a working relationship uh maybe if you have an example of of how that what you thought was a good working relationship and and how it was established yeah one of the things that i can i can think of was well when we met the holy man at the, the natchez powwow that year that was a real positive thing because it seemed like he was interested in, in reestablishing a contact between our people and his people. 
uh, unfortunately, I lost track of him after that. And then it, working with uh, uh, your your past chief, Dordor, uh, I've met him at many of the powwows. In fact, I was always a good dancer at the the, the Homa, United Homa Nation powwow. Um, and we, we sat and talked many times when he wasn't too busy taking care of problems at the powwow itself. Uh, and I always did enjoy that. Uh, I considered the fact that we were able to make this contact like we did. It kind of reestablished in part the, the relationship we had in the past when the Homa Nation was over there around Angola. Uh, in the old days, or like we used to say in the days of the grandfather's grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that I'm thinking of is, um, you know, you do interact with a lot of guests or a lot of people, um, some of them indigenous, most of them not. Um, what are some common questions that you find you get asked uh, when you're when you're working at Vermilionville about um, about being indigenous? The thing that seems to uh, impress a lot of the visitors was the fact that in the tribe the women owned everything because they did all the work. The only thing the men did was hunt and fish and protect the village. Uh, and the women did all the work, so naturally they owned everything. Um, the children inherited from their mother, not their father. Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, they have they have questions about that. They they want to know uh, when I tell them what happened to the uh, the uh, uh, Ishak. Uh, they really feel bad about the fact that the, these blankets were given to them to destroy the tribe, so that uh, the the French could take the land from them. Um, they, they ask questions about uh, what we would take to trade with people. They wanted to know what items did we have for trade. And then it goes into a long explanation with that. Uh, sometimes they ask me about the stories because I tell them, you know, that uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, skunk skins uh, in the house. But when the kids come and I tell them how the skunk got his stripe, and uh, they, so they want to hear the story. They'll ask to hear the story. They, they're interested in the stories. They're interested in the culture. They want to know how we, how we lived in the old days and how things were done. And they seem to see the logic in the way we did things. They, they, they accepted it quite readily. And they, they, they many times they say they're so glad they, they come to Vermilionville because they get to learn things that they never knew before. I said, see what happens when you go to a museum? You learn things. Uh, for one thing, uh, they, I make them aware of the fact that we have wild horses in Louisiana. Most people living in Louisiana are not aware of the fact that we have wild horses. Uh, we would, my tribe would bring the horses from Texas here until the French governor of Louisiana called us in and he says, you have to quit bringing the horses. And we said, why? Don't you like the quality that we're bringing? He said, yes, they're fine and delusion stock. He said, well, what's the problem? Is the price too high? Are we charging too much money for these horses? He said, no, in fact, we don't understand how you can go and get them in Texas and bring them here and sell them as cheap as you do. You see, what we didn't tell him is we'd go out on the plains and when we see these animals walking around with nobody watching them, we didn't want them to get lonely and lost, so we'd show them a better home. We said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, now we have too many horses. We don't know what to do with the extras. So as a result, the descendants of some of those horses are running wild today in the Atchafalaya Basin. And your people or some of your people keep track of them to make sure nobody bothers them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it sounds like you enjoy, like you, you truly enjoy interfacing with the public and sharing these stories. Is it Oh, absolutely. In fact, my feeling, and I told my wife that many times when we started working there, uh, I was actually born uh, several hundred years uh, too late. I, I should have been there uh, in the, the late 16 and early 1700s. That's, that's the time period that I feel most comfortable with. And I would have actually enjoyed being around at that time in spite of some of the things that were done to our people. 
what do you what do you find enjoyable or what do you like about telling stories and expressing or, or letting people know about um about your culture the main thing that that i i, I want them to take away with them is that there's a better way to live a way where people help each other out they cooperate that today i have the feeling that there's uh, when when the the planes flew into the twin towers in new york everybody in the country would were talking about how we were going to do this and we were going to do that today there's too much i want this or i want that or i believe this there's no we anymore and it's the we that actually makes the strength of this country and if we could get back to that uh letting them know also that in our culture we don't blame all of the white people for what's been done to us through the years through the centuries the only ones we blame are the ones who actually did the things wrong to us that an individual is only responsible for their own actions because the only person you can control is yourself. You, nobody, you can't control others. You can only control yourself. So if you've done nothing to hurt me or to hurt my people, there's no reason why I should hate you or feel bad about it or, or mistreat you. I should have just accept you for the person you are. Yeah, there's lessons there. There's a lot of lessons there. You know, what is it that, you know, that you, are there any subjects when you're, when you're interacting with guests, or is there anything that you wish people would ask that you're just, subjects that you just really, really enjoy talking about? Well, uh, I enjoy talking about uh, the, the different ceremonies that we had, the different things we did, uh, the courting rituals. Uh, that was always interesting. That was a beautiful thing. Uh, I like talking about the, the, the city matcha tribe and their baskets they wove and how they were famous for those baskets and how some of them had been found in burial sites as far away as the state of Maine because they were so valuable, they were traded that much. And how today there's only six women in the tribe who know how to make the baskets the old way. They could make it in such a way that you could even carry water in the basket without it leaking out. Wow. And, you know, to me, this is fantastic. Because the baskets my tribe made, we, we used the palmetto uh, leaf to make our baskets. And you definitely could not carry water in that. It would leak <laughs> out. But you could carry a lot of other things. And when we wanted to carry water, we would get clay and we would uh, uh, make bowls or, or jugs out of the clay. Uh, and we would use that to carry water. And it worked for us. Um, the fact that when the French came here, we convinced them to use what's called bousillage a mixture of clay and Spanish moss. Because in Europe, they used to use clay and straw. And we said, Spanish moss is so much easier. Why don't you try that instead? That's what we did. And they tried it and found out it was a really good idea. And they <laughs> took our suggestion. I imagine you have a lot of interfacing with people as, in your past role as chief and also within your, you know, within this museum work of, um, of Vermilionville and there's got to be times where you felt like this is this is a question too far is there anything that you feel uncomfortable talking about or you don't find appropriate or or you feel uncomfortable when people ask the only time that I've felt uncomfortable was comments that were made by visitors were when some of the uh, visitors from Central and South America come and they look at me and they said, you're not Indian, you're just playing a part because you're not dark enough. And uh, I, I tried to explain to them that if they had visited all of the tribes in North America prior to the Europeans coming here, they would have found a great variety that you didn't have one type of individual. They, of course, are uh, measuring all Indians by the Indians they have down there. And I, I use the term Indian because that's the term more people are familiar with than anything else. Uh, and they think that everybody should be the same color as, as their people down there. And I try to explain to them sometimes, well, you realize that the people in Europe are lighter skinned than the people in Africa. Uh, and to some, it makes them start thinking. 
Uh, in fact, there, there's the, the two legends that I've heard about the two tribes, one in uh, what was Arizona, what's Arizona today, and the other one in Arkansas, where the members of the tribe, the, the, this was this were tribes that existed prior to the Europeans coming again, who had blonde hair, blue eyes, and white skin. Um, and, you know, it, it, when you get down to the old Mech down in Central America, they definitely had features that were more African than what most people would consider Native American or, or indigenous features. Um, there was a big difference. I, I remember the story uh, that uh, on, about Crazy Horse. Uh, when he was young, the other boys in the, in the tribe would pick at him all the time. For one thing, he was shorter than they were. He had brown curly hair instead of straight black hair. Uh, he was lighter skinned than they were. They claimed that he was actually a captive that had been taken in a raid and that he really wasn't uh, Lakota. And, but the, the, the adults who knew him and knew his parents would tell the children, yes, he is. They were there when he was born. They saw him being born. They knew who he was. And he definitely was Lakota. And, you know, so it, it, even in a tribe, sometimes it happened like that. And you can't judge people by the way they look. Uh, where I live here, just south of Doosan in, in uh, Lafayette Parish, uh, I have neighbors who are African-American. And I'm darker skinned than some of them are. But yet they're African-American. Another thing that you you mentioned uh, earlier in the interview we didn't really talk too much about was university life. Um, you mentioned something offhand. I'd like you to describe a little bit more, go further into your university life and talk about, you mentioned hiding or having to hide. Well, mainly because at, at that time period, uh, again, um, anything that dealt with indigenous nations, the people at that time felt that was all past history and did not apply to modern times, that that was something that happened in the past and wasn't, uh, wasn't a part of, of the present. And uh, they knew that terrible things had been done to some of the tribes because they heard the Cherokee story of the tale of, uh, of, of tears, uh, the trail of tears. And uh, I always, it would always upset me when they would talk about that and just the, the Cherokee when I knew that it was the five civilized tribes that each one had their own trail of tears. It wasn't just the Cherokee. The Cherokee were more vocal about it, uh, rightly so. But, uh, you know, it, it, they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to accept. And uh, if you were, if you claimed to be indigenous, they really would shun you. They would want to stay away from you. Uh, they didn't want to have that much to do with you. Why? I don't know. I guess because of the difference in in uh, in race, uh, it was an attitude that was that was prevalent. Uh, at least that's the way I felt. Like they they didn't want to have anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. When I was in college, like I said, I did that uh, radio program uh, at the radio on campus, and um, the 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 name I was of foreign language broadcast director at one time. And then I also did news in French every day at noon. Uh, on Sunday nights, I did a, a French music program for uh, the, the people in the Lafayette area. And uh, they, people listened to it. Uh, I had to sort of change the name or I had to use my middle name instead of my first name because uh, Milburn doesn't translate into French. It's an Irish name. Uh, but John did definitely translate into French. So I, my program was called The French House with John Mayer. And Mayer was a French name. So it worked out well. Uh, and so most of the people in the university ended up calling me John. Uh, people started knowing me by my middle name and not my first name. Um, you know, like this idea of... Uh, of you know like a history of hiding or a history of surviving um and you know i i see that as like an adapt adaptation for survival 
Um, I, so thinking forward into the future, I'm I'm thinking about the internet and how unhide like <laughs> the internet is. I mean, everything's just out there. I also notice I'm also noticing that like you um, you have your video off for this product for this for this interview. I'm oh, wondering. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. I, oh no no no! I, I'm not it's, good with computers. <laughs> no no no! It, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just wondering and curious about like what you're, you know, like if you have this history of, you know, the Abigail seem to have this history of privacy. Um, I'm just wondering how you guys are negotiating the internet or, you know, how do you feel about the digital wild west? Oh, I'm, I'm very leery of the internet uh, because I've seen too many people get in trouble for putting too much information about themselves on the internet and ended up with getting uh, bills and things done to them. Um, I did a Facebook page for the tribe on, uh, on the internet, but I only put enough information for someone to realize that it was an, uh, an indigenous tribe. Uh, and, and I continue to put information out there every now and then, uh, talking about the history uh, of, of things that happened to, uh, to the different tribes. And uh, some of the um, American heroes, the presidents that were not really heroes by what they did, according to the way we see it. Um, so uh, I, I, the internet can be useful, but it can also be very, very harmful, just like we found on January 6th uh, with the, the, the attack on the Capitol in Washington, DC, that you know, the, the internet helped to bring that uh, together. and and. It's, it's a very good thing if it's used in the right way, but it can be something very dangerous. I got some phone calls this afternoon where people on the phone pretending to be from companies that, that, uh, I, uh, that I know, like one of them was Chase. They're trying to tell me that they want to do something to help me out. And what they're trying to do is get information so they can uh, do harm, so they can steal from me. And so I... I Personally, I tell them, sorry, I don't give any information over the phone. Uh, the only information I give is sometimes in writing, but often it has to be face-to-face -face before I give anybody any information. So I don't trust the internet. Uh, it can be a useful tool in getting some information out, but it's not something we should rely on uh, completely. And I'm trying to get my daughter to realize that she puts a lot of information out that I think at times she ought to be a little more careful about. That was my next question. I know, um, you know, as as someone who has been a leader of people and, and interacts with a lot of people, you know, your opinion on things is sometimes a little bit different than than the the um, the opinion of your community. Um, even though this is a personal interview, I'm curious to know, like, what are what are other people in the Abigail tribe thinking of uh, about the internet? Uh, them, uh, well, a large number of them do, like other Americans do. They use it too much, mm -hmm. and I try to warn them that they need to be careful. Sometimes they listen to me. Sometimes they don't. Uh, it, they have this need, I think, to try to be accepted and, and to, to be with everybody else. And for that reason, they put more information out than they should. Um, again, I, I try to convince people when I can, but they have their own ideas and eventually they're responsible for their own actions. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think the last question I was curious about is, um, you know, working at Vermilionville, I'm wondering, um, like, what is the relationship between, you know, storytelling and folklore and, and human history? And what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, uh, uh, <laughs> to tell you the truth, there was one uh, item that we used to bring out to visitors uh, where they would visit the house and it dealt with the, the chimney uh, outside, which was made of bousillage. And my wife used to tell them uh, all the time that in the old days, if only the top of the chimney was painted white, that meant that there was a young girl or girls living in the house of marrying age in case a young man was looking to find a wife. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but if the whole chimney was painted white, it was like telling the young men, sorry, fellas, they're all married. Don't even stop to ask. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Since we couldn't find proof of that in uh, on the Internet or in books, uh, the people who are in charge of Vermillionville would say, well, it's OK to tell. It's a nice story, but you, we can't really continue to say that because we can't document it. It's not documented. It's we don't have uh, proof of it. So it's more folklore than it is historical fact. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just like uh, during the Civil War, uh, blankets were used to help runaway slaves uh, find uh, places where they could hide or get food or uh, which direction to go in by the type of blanket that was put out on the lines, uh, clotheslines of the time. And we, again, we've had people in, in the, the, the museum that are saying, well, we've heard that before, but we don't have proof, so we can't really say that. And, and it's, it's not really true. Uh, this did happen. And just because it's not on the internet doesn't mean it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, just, there's a lot of things that are not on the internet that should be there. There are things that are there that shouldn't be there. <laughs> so it's... It's quite interesting. Uh, and, and I always preface anything I tell people by, in our culture, this is what the stories are. This is what we say. And if you decide you don't want to believe it, that's up to you. But I happen to know that it's a fact. And, um, but most of the time, people accept what I tell them. Because to them, it, it sounds so logical, they really can't think of an argument against it. Um, well, thanks so much for your time. I think that was my last, my last question. I'm wondering, Ida, do you have any, any questions, any ideas?